Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to have you here for this Bible study on the lectionary readings for August 2nd. And we're going to be looking at Isaiah 55, Romans 9, and Matthew 14. So that's the plan for today. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, one of the nice things about this, uh, this week's readings is that I have a big blue volume on each one. And so, for example, uh, I've got my big Romans commentary from Concordia Publishing House. I've got my Matthew Volume 2 commentary for the Matthew reading. And I've got Isaiah 40 to 55 for my Isaiah reading. So it's one of the few times uh, throughout the year that I've got a big blue book on each of the readings. So it's nice to have them. It's nice to have a Lutheran perspective on all of those texts because uh, these commentaries are from Concordia Publishing House and two out of the three are from professors that I had in class. Um, I saw Dr. Lessing who wrote the Isaiah one last summer and then I saw Dr. Gibbs the summer before that. Uh, so the summer before I came here, um, I saw Dr. Gibbs and spoke to him uh, and then he's retired uh, this past year. So um, I haven't met the guy from the Romans commentary. He's out in California. Uh, so I haven't met him yet, but uh, but yeah, it's nice to have those tools as resources. And uh, and if you have bigger questions or tougher questions, they're probably handled in here uh, in more depth. Uh, but we'll see uh, what kind of questions you got on these texts and uh, as we go through them. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the first one from Isaiah 55. So one of the things to note first as we uh, as we look at this is we are at the end um, so we're at the end of a major section so if you noticed this commentary is Isaiah 40 to 55 um, which means there's a reason why that chunk is a chunk uh, so Isaiah is typically broken into three parts and it's been a long somewhat long-standing tradition about 150, 200 years or so of doing this, um, and it has its reasons, but, it, but rhetorically and, and structurally that you can break Isaiah into these three parts, and that's 1 to 39, which is a bit more narrative oriented, the life of Isaiah, then 40 to 55, uh, somewhat prophesies um, God's saving action through his suffering servant for the nation of Israel. And then 56 to 66 somewhat focuses on longer term prophecies. Uh, so 4 to 55 kind of deals with uh, the Babylonian captivity, um, the fallout from that captivity, from Jerusalem falling to the Babylonians, uh, the hope that's going to be needed, uh, and then the suffering servant who becomes, uh, who is Christ, uh, shows up. So there's a little bit of this uh, foreshadowing into Christ's life. Um, we get our uh, Good Friday texts from Isaiah 40 to 55, um, the stricken, smitten, and afflicted text. And so those are, those are things that we find in Isaiah 40 to 55. And then 56 to 66, uh, we find the passages on the new heavens and new earth. We find uh, passages focused on the last days a bit more. Uh, and so it has a bit more longer term focus in that section. And it's important to know then, because this text comes at the very end of 40 to 55. And so if the story from 40 to 55 is the story of the salvation of the Israelite people, then the end of the story is going to be somewhat oriented around the success, the victory of God's plan. And that's what we're going to see in the first part of this text. So let's look at it now. So... Verse 1, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that, you may, hear that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, 
a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that, that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So looking at the text, um, we see there's a little bit of a, a, a call back to Isaiah 40. So Isaiah 40 starts with that come, uh, that verb there. And it's a, the first verse of verse 1, um, you hit it. It comes up here, 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 and here. And so it's, it's calling back to what was said in Isaiah 40 when this section began. So it's sort of like a bookend uh, for the entire section. So, um, so that's one of the big things going on. Now, this section can probably be divided into two parts when thinking about it theologically, and it's verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 through 5. So there's two parts here, theologically speaking. The first two verses have to do with the meal. So there's a meal going on. God is offering food. Um, he's offering bread and wine, milk, um, and so and water uh, to those without money and without price. So the first part's a meal, and then verses three through five have to do with a promise. So we'll talk about this one first, and then we'll talk about the promise here in three through five. So looking at one through two, uh, I already mentioned we have the, the note to, that brings us back to Isaiah 40. And, but we're looking at, as I said in the context, we're, we're hitting the end of, this, the, of the story. And so the end of the story has a victory meal. This is what we should understand in verses 1 and 2. God is describing a victory meal for his people. And so he's inviting everyone to come to this meal and to uh, not have to pay any money, not have to do anything to, to receive these good things. Um, but it's part of the victory feast of, of the suffering servant, of, of the king of God. Uh, and so the question, so he asks the question in verse 2, Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? In other words, why are you wasting your time on things that don't belong to God in this victory? Come, come to me, listen diligently to me, and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in the rich food I provide. Um, and so it's, it's, an, it's an invitation to come and eat and celebrate with the Lord. So, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Where would we come and celebrate a victory meal with God, celebrating the victory of the suffering servant? Confirmation students would say, the Lord's Supper. So it's a Lord's Supper sort of illusion. We're looking forward uh, to this moment, and it's an eschatological, it's an end time sort of promise. So we have the end of the story of Christ, the suffering servant uh, in his incarnation with us, and we see that in the Lord's Supper and the promise. Uh, this is a foretaste of the feast to come, as our liturgy puts it. And so not only are we looking forward to the Lord's Supper in this way, but we're looking forward to the feast that is to come and the final victory over sin, death, and the devil uh, when we are raised from the dead, and that feast. So this is looking towards not only the Lord's Supper, which we should find uh, comfort in this, that it's a thing for those who don't have anything to pay for it, for the penniless, for those who come poor in spirit, uh, this meal is for them. Uh, and then we can look forward then to the, to the end times reality that this is going to be our life in which we don't have to, to labor in vain to get the, what we need uh, because we'll be living in the new heavens and new earth and God will continue to provide for us richly and without cost. Uh, so that's a, those are 
two promises fulfilled in this Isaiah passage. Uh, we have the Lord's Supper and the eschatological new heavens and new earth, uh, end times reality uh, being expressed in this victory sort, victory meal sort of idea. Now let's look over back to three through five and look at the promise being given here. So the text says, incline your ear, come to me, hear that, you, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Uh, my steadfast, sure love for David. Uh, so the steadfast, sure love for David is referring to the Davidic covenant. The promise of David having a king on the throne of Israel forever. Um, 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant text. And in that text, we have this promise. And what God is saying is that he will invite those who hear into that covenant. So instead of it just being about David, we, I will make with you the same everlasting covenant that applies to David. Um, so we are going to have, we are going to be included in this steadfast and sure love that David received. Um, behold, I made him a witness to the peoples. So David was a witness and now we can become witnesses to the steadfast and sure love of God to all the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. Gentiles, namely, in other words, all the world, and the nation that did not know you, all those who didn't know uh, God before, which would be anyone who's not an Israelite, shall run to you. And here we have the global church that runs to Christ uh, and runs to the church because we know the steadfast and sure love of God because we're witnesses to it. And so people come to us to hear these words because we are now witnesses to that everlasting covenant. Um, because, of the, uh, because of Yahweh, your God, and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Now, I talked about that last week a little bit, the holiness idea and being glorified by God. Uh, because we have been glorified, uh, we know more about God and his glory uh, and we're witnesses to that glorification, and that glorification comes after being called and justified. Uh, so uh, this idea of being glorified uh, pops back up again. And so the promise here is promises, the promise to know God's steadfast and sure love in the same way that David did, and in the form of an everlasting covenant, an everlasting promise that we are witnesses to, uh, and that we then share with all the nations uh, that don't know God. Uh, which is just a promise of what we already know in Christ. Um, that through Christ, his victory meal, his victory over sin and death and the devil, we are witnesses to the love he has for us through the everlasting covenant um, that, uh, that he's given to us. Uh, through his body and blood, through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Uh, and so by, by being witnesses, we then confess it to the world. So there's lots of different themes going on here in Isaiah 55. Um, so we've got the, there's a lot, basically it centers around the idea of victory. That if, that we have victory and we celebrate it, at a meal, we celebrate as a victory meal, and we also celebrate it as being witnesses to what we have been told and what we have seen through God's work, namely his steadfast love for us through his victorious suffering servant that we are now witnesses to, primarily through the victory supper, um, and to all the nations. And so there's a lot of, this is a prophecy given at the, you know, near the tail end of Isaiah's life, this is probably, I'm going to say 650 BC. That's not a number I know exactly, but let's just guess there. Um, it's uh, before the fall of Israel, because Isaiah is a, an Israel, a, a prophet of Israel. Um, 
And so it's probably before 587, well, 587 is the fall of uh, Jerusalem, 730, I think, is the fall of Israel, 721, 720, 722. 722 BC is the fall of Israel, 581, the fall of Judah. Isaiah is talking before that, and so he's still looking forward to uh, something that has yet to come uh, in, in the Lord's Supper. Uh, so we're seeing this sort of, um, seeing this well beforehand. All right, so that's Isaiah 55, um, 1 to 15. Uh, let's look then to Romans chapter 9. And oh boy, is there some stuff in this passage. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about some of that. All right, so Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had, not, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. All right, I'm having trouble with the buttons today. I'm not pressing the right thing in the right order. All right, so Romans 9 comes after Romans 8, obviously, uh, but we've read a good chunk of Romans 8 the last two weeks, and the ideas of um, God choosing has come up a couple different times. And so uh, there's some clarification that needs to be done there at the end, uh, but there's a lot of ink spilled over that last part of Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. So I'm going to touch upon it. Um, and if you really want to dive into it, you're entering into the deep end. Um, and there's, there's lots of works there to sort of talk about and deal with that. Um, but I'll sort of show you the problems um, and how it's sort of dealt with and what we should gain from it. And maybe that it's not quite such a big deal as we make it into. Um, but let's look at the text now. So... This text is, again, split into two parts. Um, you have 1 through 5 up here, and then 6 through 13. So let's look at 1 through 9 for a moment. What Paul is talking about is the advantages of the Jewish people, the Jewish race, to be saved by God. Um, so, um, what sort of advantages do they have? Well, they have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises, the patriarchs, um, and that Christ came from their flesh, uh, or their ethnic line. So what Paul is doing is he's lamenting the fact that the Jews do not believe in the large numbers that you would expect. The Jews are people who know the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the adoption as God's people, the glory of God, 
uh, given to them, the worship of the temple, the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to David, to Moses. Uh, they know that Christ comes from their line, yet they don't believe. They don't listen. They don't confess Jesus as Lord. And so Paul is willing to give up his own salvation so that the rest of his brothers, his kinsmen, could have faith in, in their Lord, in God. Um, now, obviously, he can't do that. Um, but this is, his, this is his wish, that if he could give up his salvation for his brothers, he would, uh, so, that they could have, so that they could understand the glory, um, and they could understand the faith and the promises and the blessings, all that flow from Christ, uh, but they don't. Uh, and so, well, the next thing he says, but it's not as though the word of God has failed. So just because the people fail to understand, fail to listen, does not mean that the word of God has failed. It's the people who have, not the word. The word remains the word. Uh, but it's the people who have, who have closed their ears and hardened their hearts. Next, he talks about the distinction between people of the promise and people of the flesh. So, 9, 1 through 5 uh, talks about the advantages of those who belong in the flesh to God, the ethnic race of Jews, uh, but not those who are faithful. Um, and so you have this distinction that he makes between the children of Abraham or the descendants of Abraham and the descendants of the promise. Um, and that to be a person of promise does not depend on you, but on the calling of God. Uh, so we see that uh, expressed uh, when we look at 6 through 13, um, but the, the references, so there's Old Testament references here, both to, well, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob and Esau, uh, and, so, and to Sarah and Rebekah, uh, and to a little bit, and we'll talk about this in, in a minute, uh, to Leah, uh, the other wife of, of uh, Isaac. Um, Not Isaac, um, Jacob. I'm sorry, I remember. Um, so uh, we're talking about how for the people who are of the promise and the offspring are about the promise. And so let's look for a second. Um, the, the key ideas here are in verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. So when we think about God's calling, God's election, we have to keep it in line with though they were conceived children by one man, oh no, sorry, Skip that line. Though they were conceived, not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad. This is a big idea. They had done nothing, either good or bad. So, why is that a big idea? It is a big idea because what that means is sometimes when, so when, people, when dealing with God's foreknowledge and election. The answer to the problem, how does God decide between person A and person B, is that God looks ahead in their life and figures, because God's above time, 
So if time's down here, God's up above it, and he can see our lives in their fullness, and so he can decide before we're born whether or not we're going to be called or, or elected. Um, and so God is, God is watching, he's looking at your life, and he's deciding, oh, does this, is this person, go, after 70 years, are they going to remain faithful? Or is this person, oh, look at this person, this person messes up right here, and this whole life goes off the rails. So we're not going to elect this guy. This guy's a mess. Um, but this one we're going to save. And then look at this one's life. Oh, this, is a, this one's a mess too. Uh, so I'm not going to pick that one, but I'm going to pick this one and this one and this one uh, and then this one. Paul says, no. That's not how it works. God chooses between Jacob and Esau before they were born, before they had done a single action, either good or bad. So he's not, excuse me, he's not looking ahead and judging their lives and then making the decision. He's making the decision, and then that affects the person's life. So, um, so we have to put that idea off the table. God is not looking ahead, judging, and then picking. Uh, he's picking before anything's even happened. So, then we have to deal with what's going on at the end. So, looking at this part here. <clears throat> so we know, we talk about this, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So it's God's purpose, not ours, God's. And we don't necessarily get to understand why God does what he does, but he's God, so he gets to do it. Uh, and it's not because of works, but because of him who calls. So we're elected because of God, not because of us, not because we're doing good or bad things, but because God chooses, God calls, um, and then it says, uh, the older will serve the younger. It's written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now, reading Big Blue on the Romans passage, uh, one of the things I noted was that he, the, the commentator, noted that this word, hated, is a bit too strong and emotionally charged that the better translation is spurned. Um, so our translations say uh, Esau I hated, but spurned is probably the better way to look at it. Spurned has to do more with favoritism uh, than it has to do with an emotion. And so we find this in the Old Testament with Jacob and Rachel. So are Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. Jacob goes, he, so he flees from Esau, flees from Isaac and his family, and he goes and he um, is working for Laban, and um, he has two daughters, Leah and Rachel, and Jacob loves Rachel and wants to marry Rachel, and Laban says, okay, you gotta work seven years, then you can marry my daughter. He works seven years, and he gets Leah. Leah. Then he says, okay, if you work another seven years, you're gonna have Rachel. So he works another seven years, gets Rachel, okay? Then God notices that Leah is getting overlooked for the sake of Rachel. And so there's, um, there's a verse here, uh, Genesis 29, 30 to 33. It goes like this. Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served with Laban still for seven other years. Yahweh saw that Leah was hated or spurned, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and birthed a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely Yahweh saw my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again and birthed a son, and said, Surely Yahweh heard that I am hated, spurned, uh, 
And so he gave me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. So the idea here is that because her womb was open, because she has provided to Jacob two sons, that she would that he would begin to love her in the same way that he loves Rachel. And that God is doing this so that the favor towards Leah is increased. Um, but it's not as if Jacob didn't love Leah. He didn't love her as much and in a noticeable way, more than favoritism, but a, a true preference for the other. So she feels spurned and not hated. She's still spending time in his tent, uh, still part of the family. She's not being rejected and cast off and put over there, but she's just not preferred, which is, you know, why you don't have more than one wife, I guess. You're bound to prefer one over the other, I suppose. I don't know. I've never had more than one wife. So this is important then when we take that story and its context to the verse about Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau, the verse says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, Esau I spurned. And now we see it's a more of a preference than a damnation. Esau is still wildly successful by most counts. He has a large clan, a large family, lots of flocks. He's a powerful person when Jacob encounters him again. So it's not as if Esau just sort of got thrown to the side and now he's destitute, forgotten, and worthless. He becomes the father of the nation of Edom, which becomes a long-standing nation. So it's not as if he is unloved, he's simply not preferred. Now, why isn't he preferred? He's not the son of the promise. Jacob will be is change his name to Israel after wrestling with God. Israel will have 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. They'll be the people of the promise. Esau is not a person of the promise. Doesn't mean he's not loved. Doesn't mean salvation can't be given to Esau or that all the Edomites would never be saved ever in the world. It just means they're not part of the promise. Now, you know, sort of, you know, having three kids at times, it's, you hear the refrain, it's not fair. If I take Joseph to the store and leave Betsy and Zoe at home, it's not fair that I've picked one over the other. And they're right. It's not fair. It, if I brought all three, it would be fair, except then the trip to the store would take longer because I'm wrestling three kids and trying to keep them near the cart and not tipping it over and not, you know, with three kids. It's what it's like in the store. And so if I just need at one helping hand, I might just take Joseph, or I might just take Betsy, or I might just take Zoe, and the other two are, it's not fair. Right. Because you pick one, it does mean that you've excluded the others. God chooses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be people of the promise, and he hasn't picked the other ones. They will be the ones who lead the line of David who lead to Christ, and that gives them an advantage, which is what Paul is talking about in the first half, and why he's so frustrated. You are people that know the promise. You are people who have been chosen. You are people who know all these things, and yet you ignore it. And now God will choose someone else. Now God will choose any and all who will hear his word, any who will listen, anyone who will believe the testimony of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for their sins, who died and was raised for them. That's what's going to make you a person of promise.
So that's, that's the Romans 9 passage in a nutshell. There's obviously more that could be said, but that's enough for today. Then we have Matthew 14. And let's get it on the camera. So Matthew 14 deals with the um, feeding of the 5,000 plus. So let's go ahead and read that and we'll uh, uh, point out some of the, the things of note. Uh, though this is probably a fairly familiar story. Now when Jesus heard this, the this being the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. All right, again, this passage can be broken into two parts. Um, the first part being 13 and 14. Um, so this is a part, um, 13 and 14, and then 15 to 21 is the story of the feeding of the 5,000 uh, plus. Can't forget the women and children. Um, and so the first part, there's a couple interesting things. Now, basically the context is John the Baptist has been killed by Herod. Uh, Jesus finds out, which makes him sad, obviously. Um, and then he withdraws from the crowd, from the city. Uh, he takes a boat um, and cuts across the northern side of the Sea of Galilee and tries to be in a desolate place by himself to pray. Um, but the crowds know where he's going, and they followed him on foot from the towns. So, in a sense, if the Sea of Galilee's like this, and let's say he's over here, and he's going to sail over here, that's obviously the shortest route, but the people in the towns are going to walk around and find him. And so then there's going to be a big, large crowd with lots of people. See, you are missing my drawings in your life, and now here they are. Uh, so he cuts across, the people come and find him. Now this, you would imagine, would frustrate most people. He's trying to get away from people, the people won't leave him alone. Um, but he's not frustrated. He's not. He, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, one of the things that Gibbs notes in his commentary that I hadn't thought about before is that we don't often get to hear what's going on inside of Jesus' head. We don't get access to his inner monologue like other stories or narratives. Um, you know, you read Harry Potter, you get to know what Harry Potter's thinking. You get to know what all the other characters are thinking. Uh, you get to know what's inside their, their heads. Um, sometimes you get to know what Peter's thinking. Sometimes you get to know what others are thinking. Um, but rarely do you get to know what Jesus is thinking or what he's feeling. Uh, but here, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we know what Jesus is thinking. And when he sees a crowd... He has compassion on them. And that compassion leads to him healing their sick. And 
when you're looking at the different uses, when, when Matthew uses uh, this moment of understanding what's inside Jesus' head, um, it's often because Jesus sees some sort of need. He sees a reason uh, that he's needed. That, and so the best way to kind of understand this is that when Jesus has compassion on a group of people, it's because their needs are obvious to him and there's something there's something about the crowd that shows why he's needed as Savior. So what are some of the promises of God returning? And that's things like the blind will see, uh, the deaf will hear, the mute will speak, the broken will be healed, the dead will be raised, um, God will be King of kings and Lord of lords over all people, um, and there will be no, no tears and no brokenness and, and all those sort of things. And so when Jesus comes, he does those things because that's what he's come to do. He's come to heal the sick. He's come to preach the good word to the people of the kingdom of God coming into their lives. He's come to heal the sick and to, and to make the blind see and the deaf hear and the dead be raised. And so when he sees this need, he sees the physical needs and the spiritual needs of his people, he has compassion. And so he has compassion on the people and he heals them. He sees their brokenness. He sees the things that aren't right in his world. Um, he sees that this is not what he's made this world and these people to be, and he fixes it. And so there's hope there, there for us, and this is what, that this is what Jesus is about. Um, and again, the Gospels here are revealing who Jesus is and what he's for and what he stands for and what his ministry is for uh, and how that reveals the Father to us. And so we understand what, who God is through what Jesus does. And so when we're talking about, a lot, oftentimes when we're talking about these narrative sections, so we have the feeding of the 5,000, we have next week's going to be the stilling of the storm. Um, you, you are seeing something about God through the actions of Christ. Uh, and so in this story, we see not only his compassion, but we also then see his providence. And that's what we get in the second part of this, of this text. Um, now, most of you who are watching this video have heard this story before. But let's imagine for a moment that you hadn't. And let's just see how Matthew sort of unfolds this story. Um, the disciples see the crowds. They see the time. It's getting late. Everybody's hungry. It's time for dinner. We have provisions for ourselves, but not for the crowd. And the disciples, using common sense, say to Jesus, uh, it's time to let the people go home. We can't feed them. We're in the middle of nowhere. There's no town around, no restaurant, no place for them to get any food. We got to send them home before they get hangry. That's a hungry and angry blended together, in case you didn't know that phrase. Uh, but, you know, a group of people can get, can turn against you pretty quickly if they all become hungry at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, the disciples, they know what big crowds are like. They know what time of day it is. They know the situation. It's time to let them go. But Jesus says, they don't need to go away. You can give them something to eat. And again, still operating in the mode of common sense, they're like, uh, we have five rolls and two fish. Maybe we didn't bring enough for the 13 of us that are hanging out. Um, 12 disciples, Jesus, 13. Five loaves, two fish. If the loaves... Uh, we probably shouldn't think Wonder Bread here. We should probably think more dinner rolls than that, because um, the loaves aren't 
aren't necessarily large and the two fish may not be gigantic. Um, and so they don't have a lot of food either. And Jesus says, bring them here to me. Okay. And he orders the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to disciples and disciples gave them to crowds. And at this point, you're wondering, okay, maybe it's a smaller crowd. And then 20 is where the, the surprise of the tech of the story happens. And they all ate, okay, so they all ate and were satisfied. They ate enough, not only did they eat, which, you know, you can eat a little bit and everybody eats, but they were all satisfied. They ate till they were full. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. All right, so now we know there's a miracle going on. Because a crowd ate to their satisfaction, and they had leftovers more than what they started with, which was only five loaves and two fish. Okay, well, that's interesting. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And that's the big reveal here. The thing that's supposed to surprise us is the number of people fed. It's not, you know, it's not a crowd of 20. We're not talking about 20 or 30 people here. We're talking about 5,000 men plus women plus children. There, you could easily estimate 8,000. I mean, 5,000 is enough to guess, but it's more than 5,000. You've got women and children. It could be up to 10,000. To imagine that most of these men are married to the women who came along and that they would have more than one child to make up for all the men who weren't married or the women who were there without husbands, you can easily imagine that it's 10,000 people. Men plus wives plus the children I mean, it's easy to think 10,000 is not out of, out of hand. 10,000, five loaves, two fish. Five loaves, two fish, 10,000. How do you get from this math to this math? Even if the loaves were large loaves, you're not feeding 10,000. You can't feed 10,000 with the food that 13 people could carry. Couldn't happen. You can't feed that many. Uh, we should know. We feed people all the time. We've never tried to feed 10,000, but if we did, the kitchen would be full and there's no way that 13 people who didn't plan to feed 10,000 would be carrying enough food for that. So, obviously a miracle. Obviously. Now, what is the significance of the event? There's a couple things that point to the significance. What are they? Desolate place. I'll use my highlighter because in case you didn't notice, I switched to yellow. It's much easier to see. Desolate place and 12 baskets full. 12 and desolate place should throw up all sorts of flags in your head. There are 12 baskets, there are 12 tribes of Israel. They're in a desolate place, a desert place. Here we find Jesus feeding people of a large crowd in a desert kind of place where there's no food and he provides. This is supposed to call our attention back to the, Isra or to the Israelites in the wilderness and God's provision of manna and quail to them. God provided meat and bread to the people of Israel in the, de in the desert, and here he does the same again through Christ on a slightly smaller scale, uh, but still the same miracle. Uh, and now what does that show? It shows that Jesus is the God who fed the Israelites. So, if you recall, it was, okay, it was months ago. It was before the quarantine. 
So maybe you don't remember. But when Elijah is getting prepared to go up to heaven, Elisha is following behind. Elijah uh, tells Elisha to stay back. Elisha says, no, I'm going to follow. And Elisha then says, um, it's my wish, Master, that I could have twice your spirit. Uh, twice the measure of his power, basically. And what Elijah, Elijah says, if you see me depart for heaven, your, your prayer will be granted. But I don't have the sort of authority to grant you that power. And so Elijah crosses a stream, and, but he doesn't cross the stream like a normal person. He takes his cloak and he smacks the stream and the stream parts and he walks across on dry ground. And Elisha follows behind him. And then Elijah is taken up in the fiery chariot. And then Elisha uh, turns around, heads back. He takes his cloak, snaps the river, the stream, whatever, and he walks across on dry ground. Now, what does that convey? Well, it conveys that his prayer was answered because he got to do what Elijah did. By doing what was done before, it shows that he has the same power, same authority. And so that's a small example of two, two men who are able to serve as prophets of the Lord with the same spirit. And he does the same thing. Um, he heals somebody from the dead. He provides um, a miraculous amount of food uh, for another widow, just like Elijah did. And so there's these similarities that are meant to convey that uh, what Elijah was, so is Elisha. Um, so Elijah and Elisha, uh, they are the same. They both have the spirit. Their words should be taken seriously. They are prophets of God. That's what meant to be conveyed. In the same way, with the feeding of the 5,000 plus, Jesus is conveying, or Matthew is conveying to his readers that Jesus is of the same type and authority as God in the wilderness is. So if you worship the God who freed the people from Egypt and provided for them through the wandering wilderness, you should also worship Jesus. Jesus is the same God, same power, same authority as the one who fed the Israelites out of Egypt. And so that's sort of what this connection is doing and the purpose of this story in Matthew's gospel. Because Matthew's gospel is, in a sense, written for the Jews to understand who Jesus is in terms that they can understand and in the, in the same narrative of the Old Testament. Uh, so there's so many different Old Testament uh, references, so many Old Testament quotes. Um, the way Jesus' early life is portrayed is meant to be the story of Israel. Uh, from out of Egypt, I called my son. Jesus goes down to Egypt. He comes back. His, he's baptized in the Jordan River in the same way that the people of Israel are baptized in the Jordan River uh, when they cross over into the land of Canaan, into the Promised Land. Um, and so these, these narrative points are meant to be connected and this is an example of that, uh, demonstrating the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus to provide for his people. Now you tie all that together with Isaiah 55 and with this passage and you get this idea of a foreshadowing of the victory feast, the ability to provide for all people out of nothing, uh, without cost, uh, because Jesus didn't charge any money for this meal. He gave it to them freely out of his provision, out of his miraculous power. Uh, so. We see those connections then and see this sort of similar theme of how God provides for his people um, and, uh, and takes care of them. All right. Well, those are the three passages for Sunday. I haven't picked one for a sermon yet. It's just Monday. I'm still trying to sort out uh, the best, uh, best theme to work for for this Sunday. So I'm not going to let that uh, cat out of the bag quite yet. Um, mostly because I, I don't have a cat in a bag yet. Uh, we're, still, we're still working on searching for a cat. Uh, so... Uh, that's uh, those are the texts for Sunday, uh, and you'll just have to be surprised on what's uh, what's going to be the sermon text. So, thanks for joining me this uh, this week, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the study. Have a great rest of your week.